Hello, everybody. This is our um, weekly text in our My View book. And Can You Guess My Name is the name of it by Judy Sierra. And as you can see, I can click right here on background and author. There's Judy Sierra. She got hooked on traditional literature as a child when she discovered her library's fairy tale and folklore section. She now writes picture books and collections of traditional tales, which if you remember yesterday during whole group, we went over that anchor chart. Choosing the perfect topic to write about is important to her. It has to be something kids are interested in. Parents too, she says. And the background here, and this is on your, uh, in your book on page 223, tales like Rumpelstiltskin. Belief in the magical powers of name or magical power of names is ancient and widespread. According to folk belief, to know a person's name, especially a person's secret name, confers control over him or her. In traditional societies, adults warn children never to tell their names to a stranger, recounting the sad fates of those who did. Tales about guessing names also satisfy keen interest in keeping, telling, and guessing secrets. The secret names in the following tales are made-up, nonsense words, and so they are virtually impossible to guess. But everyone knows that secrets are difficult, if not impossible, to keep. Um, we have some text this week, or text vocab this week, and they are deceived, bargain, reputation, astonishment, and composure. And we're going to see those throughout this text. Um, one thing I want you to be aware of or pay attention to is the notion of, um, let me bring that a little lower. The notion, or what, what are the character traits that you come across? What are the character traits you notice? Okay, and this first one is from Sweden. And it's called Tillicher. There once was a poor woman who had only who had an only daughter, and the girl was so lazy that she refused to turn her hand to any work whatsoever. This caused her mother no end of grief. The woman tried time and again to teach her daughter how to spin, but it was of no use. Finally, the mother made the girl sit on the thatched roof of their cottage with her spinning wheel. Now the whole world can see what a lazy, good-for-nothing daughter you are, said the woman. That very afternoon, the king's son came riding by the house on his way home from the hunt. He was surprised to see such a beautiful young woman sitting on a cottage roof. He asked the girl's mother why she was there. The woman was tongue-tied. How could she tell him the truth? Oh, 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 she stammered. My daughter's on the roof because, because she is such a clever girl. She can spin the long straw on the roof into pure gold. Aha, cried the prince. If what you say is true and this maiden can spin gold from straw, she must come to the palace and be my bride. So the girl came down from the roof and mounted the prince's horse's horse behind him and off they rode. When they reached the palace, the queen led the girl to a small tower room and gave her a spinning wheel and a great tall pile of straw and said, If you can spin this into gold by the time the sun rises, you shall be my son's bride. But if you have deceived us, you will pay with your life. Deceived, that is one of our vocab words this week. What does it mean? The poor girl was terribly afraid, for of course she had never learned to spin thread, let alone gold. There she sat, her heads in her hands, crying bitter tears, when the door to the room slowly opened, and in walked an odd-looking little man. He greeted her in a friendly way, and asked why she was crying. "'I have good reason to cry,' answered the girl. "'The queen has ordered me to spin the straw into gold before dawn, or I shall pay with my life. No one can spin straw into gold.' "'No one?' asked the little man. He held out a glove that sparkled and shimmered in the candlelight. "'As long as you wear this, you will be able to spin it all into gold.' But there is a price for using my glove. Tomorrow night I shall return and ask you to guess my name. If you cannot guess it, you must marry me and be my wife. In her despair, the girl made the bargain. As soon as the little man disappeared, she put on the glove and sat and spun as if she had been spinning her whole life. By sunrise, she had spun all the straw into the finest gold. Great was the joy of everyone in the palace that the prince had found a bride who was so beautiful and so skillful. The maiden did not rejoice, though, but sat by the window and strained to think what the little man's name might be. When the prince returned from the hunt, he sat down, and to amuse her, he began to tell her of his adventures that day. I saw the strangest thing in the forest, he said. I came to a clearing, and there was a little old man dancing round, a ju round and round a juniper bush, singing the most peculiar song. What did he sing? asked the maiden. The prince replied, my bride must sew her wedding dress because she used my magic glove, and she will never ever guess Tiddlicher is the name of her love. 
The girl smiled and clapped her hands and asked the prince to sing the little man's song over and over so that she wouldn't forget. And when the prince left her alone and night fell, the door to her chamber opened. There stood the little old man, grinning from ear to ear. Before he could say a word, the girl held out, held out the glove, saying, Here is your glove, titillature. When the little man heard her speak his name, he shrieked and he spun around and around, and then with a bang and a great puff of smoke, he shot up to the air and disappeared, taking part of the tower roof with him. The girl and the prince were married, and never again did she have to spin, because, of course, spinning is not proper work for a princess. That eh, sounds to me like she got pretty lucky there, huh? And here's a story, a traditional tale from Nigeria, Yoruba, how Ijapa and Tortoise tricked the hippopotamus. The story floats in the air. It hovers. Where will it land? It falls on Ijapa, the tortoise. He is small, yet he tricked the powerful hippopotamus. Today, the hippopotamus lives in the water where he is ruler of no one. But long ago, he lived on dry land and was a mighty chief, second only to the elephant. A curious thing about the hippopotamus was that, apart from his family, no one knew his name. He had seven wives, each as big and plump as he, and his wives were the only ones, besides the hippopotamus himself, who knew what he was called. The hippopotamus and his wives enjoyed nothing more than eating. They would invite all the other animals to dine with them, and then, just as the feasting was about to begin, the hippopotamus would say, You have come to feed at my table. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. But who among you knows my name? No one should eat my food or drink my wine if he does not know my name. No, not one of the animals knew the name of the hippopotamus. What could they do? A few of them would guess, but their guesses were always wrong. Time and again, they went away hungry until at last Ijapa the tortoise could stand it no longer. You say that if we guess your name, you will let us eat your food, said Ijapa. That is not enough. I think you should do something very big, very important if we guess your name. No one will ever guess my name, bellowed the hippopotamus. But if you do, I promise I will leave the land and go live in the water, and so will all of my family. It was the custom of the hippopotamus and his seven wives to bathe in the river each morning. Ijapa the tortoise hid in the underbrush and watched them come and go, day after day. He noticed that one of the hippo's wives walked more slowly than the rest and was always the last to leave the river. One morning, Ijapa waited for all the hippos to walk down to the river. Then, while they were washing and drinking, Ijapa dug a hole in the middle of the path. He lowered himself into the hole so that he could... I'm sorry, so that he, uh, he lowered himself into the hole so that his shell looked like a smooth, worn rock. He waited as the hippo and the first six wives clamped back up the path. Then, before the seventh wife, wife came, he rolled onto his side. His shell stuck out of the hole. Sure enough, hippo wife number seven tripped on Ijapa's shell. She crashed to the ground and rolled onto her back. Help, she shouted. I can't get up. Isantim, my husband, come quickly. Help, Isantim. While the hippopotamus helped wife number seven to her feet, Ijapa the tortoise walked home, repeating, Isantim, Isantim, Isantim. From morning till night, he said the word to himself softly so that no one else could hear. Isantim, Isantim, Isantim. At his next feast, the hippopotamus proclaimed as usual, You have come to feed at my table. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. But who among you knows my name? No one should eat my food or drink my wine if he does not know my name. Ijapa cleared his throat. <clears throat> then he said, Be quiet, Isantim, and let me eat. The hippopotamus's mouth dropped open. He was speechless. A cheer went up from all the animals. Hooray for Ijapa! They sat down and ate Isantim's food and drank Isantim's palm wine. When the feast was over, Asantam and his wives carried all their belongings to the river. That is where they live today, because Asantam allowed himself to be tricked by Ajapa the tortoise. Ooh, this one's from Japan, a place I've always wanted to visit. Oniroku. High in the mountains of Japan, there flowed a raging river that surged and whirled around rocks and boulders. Since the beginning of time, there had been no way to cross that river, whether on foot or on horseback or in a boat. The people who lived near the river had tried again and again to build a bridge, but each time the river's powerful currents brought their handiwork crashing down. In a faraway city there lived a man who was rumored to be the finest builder in all of Japan. His fame spread throughout the country until at last news of his great skill reached the people who lived in the village beside the river. They sent a messenger, offering whatever price he asked to build a bridge for them. The master builder came at once, eager to test his skill. He stood on the riverbank, looking out at the whirlpools and waterfalls that he would have to conquer, and he thought, There is no bridge that will withstand the power of this river, yet if I do not build one here, my reputation will be ruined. 
As the builder pondered his situation, an oni, a hideous orned ogre, arose from the river. Sun! The oni's long, tangled hair swirled about him, and his enormous eyes flashed like lightning. You can never build a bridge here, thundered the oni, unless you have my help. I bring them all down, yes, I bring them all crashing down. The builder began to tremble and shake. Then the oni spoke again. If you should agree to pay my price, I will not only allow a bridge to be built here, I will build it myself, tonight, while you sleep. How much money would the oni want? Oni want, the master builder wondered. The people of the village had offered him any price he asked. Very well, he told the oni, I will pay your price. Then he went to a local inn for the night, but the uneasy memory of making a bargain, bargain with an oni kept him away for a long time, awake for a long time. The next morning, the builder hurried to the spot where he had met the oni. There, to his great astonishment, a magnificent wooden bridge, high and strong, arched above the wild currents of the river. At the foot of the bridge stood the oni, smiling and showing his gruesome yellow tusks. And now for my payment, he said, you must give me your eyes. My eyes? The master builder cried out in anguish. No, no! How had he fallen into the oni's trap so easily? He dropped to his knees and pleaded with the monster, tears streaming down his cheeks. Oh, very well, said the oni at last. Since you carry on this disgusting manner, I will give you one chance to escape your fate. If by sunset you have learned my name, you may keep your eyes. If not, they are mine. The oni strode onto the bridge, jumped over the side, Sun! and sank beneath the swirling rapids. The builder turned and ran into the forest. He had no idea how he could ever discover the name of the oni. Deeper and deeper, he plunged into the silent woods. Then he, then he heard the sound of drumming and the footsteps of dancers. Tangura, 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 tangura. He walked toward the noise and found a clearing among the, tree, among the trees where six or seven little oni children were dancing and clapping their paws and singing. When oni roku brings the eyes, how happy we will be. When oni roku brings the eyes, how happy we will be. The builder's heart pounded with joy and excitement. He turned and ran back to the river. Oni Roku! Oni Roku! He shouted. Where are you, Oni Roku? The water churned and bubbled, and sun! The Oni's hideous face appeared in the water. How did you learn my name? The Oni raged. Who told you my name? His face turned crimson, and great gusts of steam shot from his nose and mouth. At last he regained his composure. Keep your silly eyes, he rumbled, but never tell my name to anyone else, and do not ever dare come back here again. You may be sure that the Master Builder never did. There's a picture of the Oni right there. All right, guys. So we're going to be referencing these texts when we meet for a whole group, and we're going to be talking about character traits of the various characters in the text. Specifically, I want to examine the actions of characters in the text and how we can tell their traits through their actions.